In um, September 2005, two months after the London bombing, the Security Council adopted Resolution 1624, which was dedicated to countering incitement of terrorist acts motivated by extremism and intolerance. And this is the first universal instrument, instrument which squarely addresses the issue of incitement to terrorism at an international level. It's actually the third generation of international measures against terrorism. First, there were the treaties that dealt with specific um, terrorist offenses. The second generation was measures um, for curbing terrorist financing. And it seems that the third generation of measures are when the international attention is turning towards the sociolo sociological aspects of, ter of terrorism prevention. The resolution was supplemented in 2008 by a, a report of the Secretary General, which, um, among other things, offered preliminary guidelines for implementing the resolution. What I intend to do here is to highlight um, and critique some of the guiding principles that are reflected in the resolution and in the, guide, in, in the Secretary General guidelines um, in order, I hope, to allow a better appreciation of Ambassador um, Alan Baker's draft. And I'll also, in to just for, for contrast or comparison, I'll also um, um, refer to another instrument that was adopted in 2005, which is the European Convention on the Prevention of Terrorism. Hopefully this will also be somewhat of a bridge between uh, what Professor Gordon was speaking about in terms of genocide and the draft convention. But first, just a couple of words about the very notion of criminalizing incitement and the international level. And the question is, is criminalization of incitement an effective tool against terrorism? The assumption that terrorism can be curbed if incitement is effectively uh, repressed is la largely a factual conjecture. The International Domestic Legal Offensive Against Inciting Speech doesn't rely on any empirical information as to the causal determinants of terrorism or as to whether prohibiting incitement is a rational response which is capable of countering terrorism. Now, incitement might be vital for the success of the terrorist campaign. And this is certainly the case when the terrorist, um, sorry, the, when the terrorism um, takes place on a, on a wide decentralized scope, as is the case with uh, groups like, such as Al-Qaeda. And then large-scale mobilization is necessary for sustaining it. And moreover, when um, terrorism is mobilized not against any specific cruelty or repression, but rather to advance some sort of abstract ideal, engaging people to serve it is not easy people don't act on their own initiative in furtherance of abstract ideals. So they need to be instilled with a sense of rage and hatred that would lead them to take action, um, you know, basically to kill other people and also to put themselves at risk. And this is what incitement provides. So there's good reason to assume that prevention of incitement would be a, a, an effective tool against the terrorist acts themselves. On the other hand, um, the perception of terrorism that is considered here that I'm talking about is very specific. It's the terrorism the Western states are grappling with um, in, the, in, the, in the recent years, which is based on extreme ide extremist ideologies that don't really have a clear objective. But this is not the only kind of terrorism that there exists. If you think about terrorism until the 1990s, it was often associated with political liberation movements, with socioeconomic change. Um, just to get demonstrated on a global scale, if you think of the German Rote Arme Fraktion, the Butter Meinhof group, or the Peruvian um, Sendero Luminoso, or the Japanese groups, and even Hezbollah and Hamas. They all clearly reflect a different kind of conduct, which is limited geographically and contextually, and is probably less dependent on wide-scale dissemination of ideas. Um, for example, it might be easier to, to achieve individual enrollment of members uh, without needing to, to go through mass recruitment. And also, the, the motives for Gold old-fashioned terrorism um, could arguably be, be immediate benefits, in which case there's much less need for this persuasive campaign. So, it's what, what, is important to what is important to acknowledge um, is that the current trend of combating terrorism is informed by the motive for the terrorism. And criminalizing incitement might be a dangerous path if a generally applicable measure is adopted with only one type of a phenomenon in mind. Now, Resolution 1624 calls upon all states to prohibit, lines, um, to prohibit incitement to commit terrorism, um, terrorist acts or acts, but it, it stresses that the measures that are taken need to comply with international legal, legal obligations, especially international human rights and particularly the freedom of speech. And to, abuse, to, to prevent abuse of the criminal prohibition on incitement in order, sorry, to prevent abuse of the criminal prohibition on incitement in order to repress legitimate speech, there should be some clear delineation of the scope of speech which may be prohibited and of the circumstances in which it may be prohibited. And different instruments offer different models in this respect. And I'd like to look at three components of these um, models. One is the, what is terrorism or what, what sort of reference is made to terrorism. The other one is what type of prohibited speech would be criminalized. And the third one is the probability of harm. Now, um, 
I'm getting very legalistic here, but that's you know, my job, so humor me. Resolution 1624 speaks of incitement to terrorist acts, and specific acts have been criminalized and declared offenses by international treaties. But the resolution doesn't speak of terrorist offenses, it speaks of terrorist acts, and so do the Secretary General guidelines. So this is a relatively wide scope of target conduct. On the other hand, the resolution distinguishes between direct and indirect incitement. It repudiates attempts to, at the just, um, repudiate attempts at the justification or glorification of terrorist acts, but it calls on states to criminalize only direct incitement. And in this respect, I think that the resolution and the guidelines are a bit um, disappointing because modern terrorism, by which the resolution is informed, is dependent on winning hearts and minds. And this is done by pervasive, persistent vilification and disparagement of the victim, not by direct calls to action, at least not in the early stages. So in order to, prevent, to effectively prevent this process, the prohibition has to go beyond direct calls. So I would argue that the type of speech that may be prohibited under the resolution is presently so narrowly defined that it might actually um, fail to address the phenomenon which, for which it was tailored. Just for contrast, the European Convention um, calls for prohibition on public provocation, and public provocation is a message to the public with intent to incite the commission of a terrorist offense. Basically, it refers both to direct and indirect incitement. But the Convention also speaks of terrorist offenses. So there's a trade-off here between the two elements. On the one hand, there's a wider definition of what would be considered the terrorist act, the target conduct. On the other hand, there's a, a more... Um, um, in the, in the resolution, there's the, the terrorist act is defined more widely, but what would be considered an incitement is defined more narrowly. Now, if I look at Ambassador Baker's draft, and, and I realize that I'm kind of jumping the gun here, but um, I couldn't resist that temptation. Um, he speaks of acts or acts of terror, or also terror of violence against a target group, which is a very wide definition of the target conduct. He also uh, refers to directly or indirectly calling upon, in other words, direct or indirect incitement and public vilification. So here we have a very wide scope of, con of target conduct and a wide scope of um, conduct that would be regarded as incitement. So this brings me to the third element of the balance, which is what is the requirement of probable harm for speech to be criminalized? Usually when, we, when there's a prohibition on speech, whether it's administrative or criminal, we require some sort of prob probable harm. In Israel, it would be imminent danger. Um, for example. Um, resolution 1624 doesn't say anything about what should be the probable, what, what, what is the probable harm element. And I was thinking about why is the resolution silent, and I'd like to consider two possible explanations, and in fact to reject both of them as insufficient. According to the first explanation, the potential for harm is inherent in the speech itself, um, in the sense that, well, well this would be true, where the potential harm is so grave that even a very low probability of materializing would be considered as justifying a prohibition. In other words, from the speech itself, we can infer that harm is likely to be caused. Um, an example of this approach is actually the prohibition on direct and public incitement to genocide, which has been labeled the crime of crimes and the gravest of crimes. And when the, when the incitement is both direct and public, the risk of genocide materializing can be inferred with sufficient certainty from the speech itself. The question is, does this argument also apply to terrorism? So that direct and public incitement to terrorism should be pr prohibited, period. Um, first, how grave is terrorism? Now, in terms of harm to, you know, bodily harm, much less than genocide, obviously. It might be very little, in fact, but I don't think that's the point. I think the point is that terrorism um, is an attempt to undermine the operation of acceptable mechanisms of governance, in some, in, in some case, to replace them all together. Um, so if we think in terms of extremist religious terrorism that we come across today, it might be indeed grave enough to justify the presumption of harm. But I would argue that that presumption can at best be sustained if the incitement is direct. And if we're looking at a prohibition such as in the European Convention or in Ambassador Baker's draft where incitement can also be indirect, I would say that the, prohibition, that the presumption of harm would be unjustified. We would need to show some probable harm. A different explanation for the absence would be that um, the harm and incitement is not just because it increases the chance of the terrorist act actually taking place, but because the speech itself is harmful. And this is the rationale for prohibiting discriminatory or racist speech. We don't look at what might happen later. We just say that the speech itself is, is, is criminal. Um, and again, in the case of genocide, there's a clear overlap between the target of conduct and the notion of discrimination or racism. 
But terrorism and discrimination are separate issues. Um, not every terrorist act is necessarily discriminatory or racist. Um, however, it's interesting that the Secretary guidelines, uh, the Secretary General, sorry, guidelines do suggest a linkage between the two. And trust me on this, I'm not going to quote a five, um, um, five line sentence just to prove that. Ambassador Baker's draft also suggests that there's a link between terrorism and discrimination. It specifically mentions ethnic and racial hatred in the preamble. It draws partly on Resolution 6024, but also on the Durban Review Conference, which was on racism. Um, the introduction of the, the introdu introductory text of the draft specifically refers to anti-Semitism. And it defines incitement not only by reference to terrorism, but also by reference to violence against a religious, national, or ethnic group. So this linkage, again, reflects the perception of terrorism that it was, I noted before, namely an ideological conflict between civilization. But neither the Resolution 1624 nor the draft is limited to that kind of terrorism. So again, the assumption of immediate and inherent harm, I would argue, is inappropriate. So in view of my, my own conclusion that there is no basis for an automatic assumption that harm would be caused, um, I think it's appropriate that all the different instruments do require some sort of um, proof of probable harm, and if you have the different formulations in the Secretary General's guideline, it is directly causally responsible and likely to result in criminal action. Both the European Convention and Ambassador Baker's draft speak of incitement that causes a danger that a terrorist act or whatever occurs. Um, th this threshold has been criticized as excessively low, and it might be applicable in Europe, even there there's criticism of it, but it might be applicable in Europe where there's some sort of common ethos and common um, um, consensus or internal consensus on human rights restrictions at the universal level, which the draft is uh, directed at, I think it's much too open to abuse. So I would argue that a higher threshold is required. And I tried to summarize all of this in a table, which basically includes all everything that I've said so far. Um, but what I've colored in yellow were the places where the threshold um, for intervention, for criminal intervention, is, is low. And as you can see, in resolution, in the resolution 1624 and in the European Convention, there's some sort of trade-off between either a wide definition of the terrorist act and a, and a limited definition of probable harm or what would be incitement or the, uh, or the opposite. In Ambassador Baker's draft, we have a wide definition of what a terrorist act is. We have a wide definition of conduct that would be prohibited, direct or indirect incitement. And we have a low threshold of probable harm. Um, Personally, I would be surprised if Western states subscribe to this um, standard. As I said, in Europe, even the existing standard, which is higher, is considered to be excessively um, restrictive of speech. I, I don't see the United States going for anything even remotely similar. And I would caution against a formula that might serve states that attempt to repress legitimate speech under the guise of preventing incitement to terrorism. I'll just, two remarks in conclusion. Um, one is about the linkage between terrorism and extremism. Um, th this linkage might result in the use of terrorism as a cover for actually prohibiting hate speech. Now, the idea to prohibit hate speech is a good idea, but I don't think that the route of doing it through terrorism is a very wise one. The second matter is the matter of fragmentation. Um, the focus in the, in the present instruments on a specific manifestation of terrorism, namely the fundamentalist religious one, as opposed to political or socioeconomic one, um, is, is reminiscent of the general strategy of international action against terrorism. The idea that we have, like, tw I think, 16 treaties against terrorism, each of them deals with one specific aspect. But this piecemeal fashion of the past was caused by political controversy. What we have now, if we have a, a fragmented tre treatment of a criminal offense, um, it might have substantive consequences. We might have blanket prohibitions on speech that are actually justified only in very limi limited contexts. I think this carries a risk that the battle against terrorism would actually be a cover for abuse of power. Thank you very much.